Hi, and welcome to the Insiders by Durham Lane, where we get perspectives from industry thought leaders about strategies that are unifying marketing and sales cycles to help accelerate growth inside your world. Hello and welcome to a special episode of the Insiders Sales and Marketing Podcast. I'm Simon Hazeldean. I'm a sales transformation strategist and sales performance consultant. I'm also a keynote speaker and the author of a number of books on selling and negotiation. For today's episode, however, I'm handing over the hosting reins to my co-host, Richard Lane, the CCO and co-founder of Durham Lane, who are an inside sales partner that help businesses to grow their revenue through an integrated sales and marketing methodology. So, Richard, feel free to introduce this week's special guest. Thank you, Simon, and hi to everybody. This episode is truly providing the inside track as I was with this guest in person at Durham Lane HQ for a conversation where we put the headphones on and and got live and dangerous. I spoke with Graham Hawkins. Graham is the founder and CEO of Sales Tribe. He visited Durham Lane recently, traveling from Melbourne and Australia. Graham is a inspirational speaker and leader in the world of digital and data-led selling. Absolute pleasure to host him. We had a really interesting discussion about salespeople, the sense makers, and the salespeople as the storytellers. I'm excited for you to hear some of Graham's insights. Fantastic. Looking forward to hearing it. Hi, it's Richard Lane here from Dome Lane, and I'm delighted to be joined by Graham Hawkins from Sales Tribe. Really thrilled to have you with us at Dome Lane HQ and have the opportunity of holding this brief podcast with you. So welcome. It's been an eye-opener, sir, being up in this part of the world and um, my first trip to Newcastle. So yeah, great to be here. And you brought the sunshine with you. Of course. Which, uh, we always appreciate. So thank you for that. Of course. Why don't you give us a thumbnail sketch of Sales Tribe so listeners can understand what you guys do and then let's weave the conversation and see where we go. Yeah, look, we're we're very focused, as you know, Richard, on digital sales enablement. So helping businesses come to terms with what's now required to be successful in the global digital connected economies. The world has changed. The, the buyer now has access to information. They can serve themselves in many cases. They're at least, according to some, they're at least 60 to 80% of their way through decision making before they reach out to a salesperson. And in many cases, they can solve their own problems. So we're helping businesses come to terms with all of that and what that means in terms of being able to change the sales playbook to match the buyer journey. It's a big focus on what we do. Absolutely. And and I think as we we ran a session, didn't we, yesterday, and I think what really came through to me there and and Durham Lane as a outsource integrated marketing and sales business, we take real pride of representing our customers at the very front end of their acquisition journey with with their prospects. And it just struck me that a lot of the things we take for granted in terms of how we create opportunity, the tactics we deploy from digital sales, you know, omni-channel, et cetera, feel, feel sort of normal. But actually, I think out in the big wide world, people are still coming to terms of how do I engage digitally? Would you agree, agree with oh, that? Oh, 100% agree. Look, because of the way sales has evolved over the, the journey, you know, over decades, we have a prevailing attitude still that sales is a numbers game and all you need to do is make as many calls as possible and have as many meetings as possible and that will result in sales success. And of course, that no longer is the case. So everybody, regardless of industry now, their biggest challenge, I think, Richard, is how do I start a conversation? You know, we said yesterday, opening is the new closing. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, how do you get a conversation started with an educated buyer who has ac- access to information and who no longer wants to meet you in person? So these are some of the challenges we're dealing with. And I think showing people how to do that the right way now, I think it, logically most of our clients know they need to shift. They need to change. They just don't know where to start. And I think having an outsourced capability that you can bring in that can be embedded inside the business and show them how to fill the top of the funnel the right way, I think personally that's the perfect scenario. Yeah, and I I think there's that exciting opportunity to to be the bridge. You know, the bridge between, and this is where Sales Tribe and Durham Lane, I think, work really well together because we can create opportunity through MQL to SQL to conversion, or we can just take MQLs being created and convert to SQL and augment the proactive outbound work we're doing. But then really importantly, it's about coaching and teaching and supporting the AEs and the business development managers with inside the client to be able to do some of that themselves too. Yeah. And is that where, is that where you spend most of your time, sales tribe's perspective? It is. And look, let's let's get one of the big challenges out on the table right now. We can bring in all of this modern thinking and we can say, look, just you know, change your sales playbook to match 
the buyer journey and we can, you know, we can do the buyer journey mapping and the ideal customer profiling and the buyer person. We can do all of that. But unless you've got senior leadership inside the client, recognizing and acknowledging that you have to change the way you measure, manage and reward your salespeople. You know, this terrible thing that we've talked about, Richard, the terrible tyranny of short-termism where everyone's end of month, end of quarter, hurry quicker, yes. faster. You have to start to bring in some of that top-down thinking as well, as well as teaching the you know, the SDRs and, and of course, the AEs and the BDMs how to embrace these new skills. Yes. So it's a bit of a, if you like, a bit of a pincer movement. Yes. And and another interesting thing is you looked out at the Sea of Durham Lane is in front of you in Newcastle and then also the, the bigger Sea of Durham Lane is online mm-hmm. through the team's lens. I was sort of sitting there and I think we discussed this at the end of the, of the session, but I don't think it's as big a change for for some of these guys. You know, they've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with all of these tools and it's just sort of the norm. So I wonder whether people like you and I and also leaders in organizations and probably lots of BDMs and and AEs in in corporates have got a bigger learning curve than some of those coming up behind us. Was it Yoda that said you have to first unlearn what you've learned? Yes. You know, like... (laughs) So, yeah, older guys... I've got over the fax, by the way, Graham. So uh, no longer do I wait for the fax machine to buzz and to purr for the order to come through. That used to be one of my major moments. Yeah, of course, me too. Um, Showing our age here, Richard, but no doubt, I think people who've been in sales in that that sort of brute force sales model that I grew up with, they're having to, you know, unpick bad habits and they're having to relearn some new skills. Your team here, I was impressed with, you know, A, the growth mindset and B, the, you know, the digital native nature of how they go about doing their job. Yeah. So I think it's not as big a leap for the younger generations, no doubt, because, you know, let's be clear, the buyer now resides online. Yeah. And these younger generations are more used to engaging with, you know, the modern tools and the data and the, the platforms. So they're, they're, they're sitting here listening to this going, of course they do. Yeah, <laughs> of course, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it, 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 yeah, whether it's something you're comfortable with or not, it's a huge shift. We, yep. need to, we need to move into it. We need to use the plethora of tools around and available to support us. Yep. At the end of the day... You know, our mantra number one, business fit, business value, developing long-term relationships. I think that applies no matter what communication mechanism you're using. Yep. You need to be relevant. You need to be concise. You need to be topical. You need to be action-orientated. And if you sort of follow a methodology like that, then, you know, you should be engaging with people. And let's face it, if they don't want to engage with you, then maybe it's just not right right now. And yeah. it's, you know, and that changed my mind when I sort of first thought of that because suddenly it became not personal. Yes. You know, actually, when it is the right time, if you've been relevant and you haven't spammed someone over and over again, then, you know, you should be top of their list for people to call. Correct. Yeah, there's a there's a new mindset required. I, 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 you know, dumb it down and I say, look, we just have to learn how to sell smarter in a world of smarter buyers. Educated buyers with access to information, you know, our role is no longer the information giver, it's the sense maker. Yes. You know, so I've I've got to be good with data. I've got to know how to find that little gold nugget that the buyer might not be able to find themselves and then communicate that to them in a way that makes sense. The other mindset shift, I think, which your team gets, Richard, is that buyers don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So demonstrate to them that you understand who they are, that you know their business, and then be willing to personalize to their context. Teach them something, and then if you can, anticipate their future needs as well. So don't don't just solve my current problem, solve my future problems as well. So I talk about us being the storytellers. Yep. But it's actually both, isn't it? You need to be the sense maker and the storyteller because you make sense through stories. 100%. You make it relevant through stories of how you've helped people like the people that you're trying to help. Yeah. And that makes sense to the individual. And they can more typically align to a similar situation than we ever could in, in our world. So Yeah, well, the buyer, yeah. the buyer's grappling with so much information now, so many suppliers, global suppliers. So... Quite often, they don't know which way to go, and that's why you get a lot of stuck deals in the middle of the funnel, right? They're just not sure. They they can't decipher all of the information. So if if you can come in as a salesperson and be the sense maker, and then, as you say, make sense with a story that taps into emotion, you've got it nailed. Yeah, we should brand that. Sense makers, storytellers. (laughs) That's the the, the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. And and you, in your business, Sales Tribe, you're, you're based in Melbourne, Australia. Yep. You've got a global reach through a platform that is available to everyone. How many million users on LinkedIn? 800 million 800 plus. 800 million plus. Yep. Not connected to all of them, but you know, 
you're connected to many. Why don't you share just the story of how some of those those enterprise corporate deals that you've won have, have come about? Would you be able to do that? Yeah, happy to. Look, it still to this day surprises me. And you know, sometimes I pinch myself when I think about a little Australian company founded five years ago can have clients in in the UK here like Lloyds Bank and Rent a Kill and you know S and P Global and PwC in the States all because of what you just said and that is creating visibility on the world's greatest business platform that's ever been produced yeah LinkedIn yeah so yeah I, I began the journey really briefly Richard I began the journey sort of six years ago publishing content on LinkedIn and not really knowing what I was doing to be honest but I decided I'd try and carve out a little a little position of thought leadership I'd been in sales long enough to know a little bit about what I'm talking about. So just started pushing out content, but in parallel building my network. And the more content I pushed out, the more opportunity I got to build my network. The bigger the network got, the more people saw the content. And the two just started to you know grow, almost grow a life of their own. So next thing I'm getting inbound leads and inquiries from all parts of the world, um, simply because I was taking the view that visibility creates opportunity so just get yourself out there yeah you know not everybody's going to like you or your message and i like you i learned to accept that that's not always going to be the case but there are some and you only need one or two really important clients like um lloyd's bank and whatnot and away you go and we've built our business in five years from scratch to having now clients all around the place it's it's unbelievable yeah it's a great great story and, and it goes back to that old adage of content is king i guess yeah. doesn't it yeah content i, I go the next step now it's no longer king it's the whole royal family <laughs> <laughs> so one of my one of my match one of my managers when you know back in my corporate life used to when i i worked in e-learning but it used to be uh, build it and they won't come yeah um, but actually what you're doing is you're creating it and you're putting it somewhere they already are yeah and that's creating interest and you're genuine and so genuine you know, being genuine, I think, creates interest for people anyway. Our third mantra: be interested to be interesting. You know, the more interested we are in other people, funnily enough, the more interested they become in you. Yep. And then being able to turn that into a conversation is key. Yeah. And then you can then progress through your sales process. Yeah. And look, here's the here's the thing that most of these social media gurus and there's there are a dime a dozen now, of course. Here's the thing they won't tell you: it's all very well to create the visibility. Anyone can push out posts and anyone can get likes and followers and shares and all of that stuff. The hard work is really in the the constant relationship building and the nurturing. The engagement. The engagement, correct. So I don't shy away from telling people the truth about that. There's no silver bullet here. There's no quick fix. You've got to, as I did, you've got to build those relationships over time, establish credibility, nurture relationships and good things start to happen. Yeah. We call it, we call it, encouraging serendipity yeah so no shortcuts it's it's like i mean it's sort of uh in a way it's quite comforting yeah you know that actually hard work pays off yeah. <laughs> you know? so if you're not there if you're not visible on the platform if you're not creating great content then you're not going to get the interest but if you are and you work it and you use the network as for as a proper networking tool then you create success just like the old days when you and I would get our list and we would cold call and we knew that we had to prospect and we would churn through the calls, you know, that was hard work. Yeah. But we did the hard work knowing that it would produce the result. It's the same on social yeah. and digital. So, yeah, don't think you can just put up a few posts and then sit back and wait for the leads to roll yes, in. absolutely. And I, and I think there is a lot of that around, right? A lot of a lot of people think that I just put a post up and off we go, but... You yeah. know, I know myself that, you know, I think LinkedIn gives you this privilege of being able to build a network and communicate with people in a way that you haven't been able to prior, yeah. but you still have to work it. You still have to, you know, be of interest. You still need to understand what's important to them, saw this and thought of you. Yeah. You know, you need to be able to use all of these things to show that you're in touch and in tune with, with what they're trying to achieve and to, that you could be a, a provider that helps them achieve their goals. 100%. I just want, with all of my clients, I just want them, when they do move into a buying window of some sort, and that happens in the dark, as we talked about yesterday, yep. you know, how do you light up your dark funnel, as they say, when a buyer sounds realizes- like, Sounds like a song, that. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, when a buyer moves into a buying window, they become aware that there's a problem they need to solve or there's a better way of doing something. I want them immediately to think of my business. Yeah. We have no control over that as salespeople. When the buyer realizes, oh, we've got a problem we need to fix here, who do we know? 
Yeah. Oh, that's right. The guys at Durham Lane. Yeah. So, so I, I always give credit for where the quote comes from, and I wish this one was mine, but it's not. It belongs to someone I know in in Canada called Craig Elias, and he talks about the window of dissatisfaction. Yeah. And um, I love Craig's term because it's so visual, isn't it? Like I'm a business leader or a functional leader or head, whatever it might be. I know I've got a problem. I haven't started solutioning for it yet, but I'm looking for answers. Yep. Our job on behalf of our customers that we represent is for us to pop up at that moment and go, hey, saw this or thought of this or yep. noticed this, yep. you know. Have what, you considered this? What yeah. What would happen if, you know, and, and um, I, I just love that phrase. And it's for me, it's such a visual picture of the window of dissatisfaction. You know, yep. I'm, I've not found a solution yet. I'm not in buying mode, but I'm in, I'm just pre-buying mode yeah. and I'm in, exploration and that's when you can become a real partner i think yeah and look there was some study done professor collar somewhere i think over here in the uk did some study about how people firstly go about solving problems and apparently we interrogate our memories first before we start a google search we immediately think oh i've got a window of dissatisfaction i've got a problem who do i know oh that's right the guys from durham lane they talk about outsource sales and mql that's so we as humans, we do that first before we start doing our research on Google. So if you're present in their mind, top of mind, as they say, you're a chance to influence the sale right from the start. Yeah. Yeah. And it, interesting. I was just, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, I always look at my kids and think, how do they do it? Yeah. And I wonder, do they interrogate their minds before they go to their phone? I don't, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, yeah. particularly my little one. He's 11. And I sometimes think that he goes there for answers first. Yeah, so maybe right. that's another change that's coming and, yeah. you know, makes me feel even older. But I think that's, uh, you know, it's the sort of the digital first type approach, isn't it? So. It really is. Yeah. And the other thing in, in amongst all of that digital first approach that we have to be aware of, I think, is that more and more of the B2B buyers that we're selling to these days are millennials themselves. Indeed, indeed. And that's just going to increase. If your sales team hasn't got a playbook that caters for millennial buyers, you, you potentially, you know. Indeed. And, and maybe just sort of final topic before we close out. If, you're, if your organizer just doesn't have a playbook, maybe full stop, you know, because I think you found, haven't you, discovered recently that many, many companies don't even know what you're talking about. No. Um, it's a somewhat interesting term, playbook, and it means different things to different people. But I quite often say to sales leaders, do you mind just showing me a quick look at your, your sales playbook? And I get a blank look. You know, more often than not, what do you mean by playbook? I said, well, you know, have you got a doc? <laughs> How have do you, you do what you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you got a documented process or a playbook that you follow? How do you onboard salespeople when they arrive? How do you show them this is how we do things around here? And, you know, again, depending on your definition of playbook, it can mean all of the tactics, the methodologies, all of the frameworks, all of the contents, how you measure, what does good look like. That's a playbook, you know. Yeah. But quite often, I find most people don't have one. So helping them build a playbook to start with is a good place to start. Yeah, it is fascinating that you've got global organizations often, and all sorts of organizations, but including global ones, that haven't got the manual of how to work with their customers, which it's, is- It's astonishing. Sort of crazy. It's asto This is the part of the business that drives growth. This is the part of the business that creates the lifeblood for your business, the revenue. These are the people who are engaging with your customers and you don't have a defined playbook? Hello? <laughs> yeah, sort of sort of crazy, isn't it? So maybe, uh, you know, if you, if you listen to this and you haven't got one, then uh, we can probably help you. So reach out either to Graham or myself and we'd be happy to, uh, to share some insight into that. But, you know, everyone needs a manual. I think it was Dwight Eisenhower that said, in preparing for battle, I found that uh, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Yes. So, you know, that sort of links back into uh, that theory. To go with that one, I think Napoleon said, did he not, that war is 90% information. Yes. So, right. you know, data, collecting yeah. the data and the information and the knowledge, thats yeah, they, yeah. they go hand in glove, those two. Very good. Well, Graeme, it's been lovely having you with us. Really appreciate you making the uh, the trip up to the Northeast, bringing the sunshine with you. Absolutely. And um, really great to be able to uh, catch this impromptu podcast. I hope to everyone listening that you've enjoyed it. And I'm sure we can do another one sometime soon, Graham, from uh, maybe the other side of the world, but we can sort that out through, uh, through technology. So exactly. um, great to have you with you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. Cheers. Okay, so Simon, what do you think? Well, there's, there's an absolute 
ton of fantastic things I could reference, Richard, from your from your conversation with Graham. But one that particularly stands out because I'm a big fan of using storytelling as part of the sales approach. We know that's very very powerful. It was that phrase where the sense makers and storytellers that that I think particularly resonated for me. Yeah, I love that, Simon. So I, I like you sort of talk about we're the storytellers. And, and I think what I now say following my conversation with Graham is that we're the sense makers and the storytellers. And and that really links into our first sales mantra, which is business fit, business value, developing long term relationships. So, you know, our job as sales professionals is to help our customers and those we want to be our customers to resolve some of the challenges they have and to think differently about how they can work with their customers or can find new customers or you know how they sell their products and services and and to think differently so our job is to help them make sense of their world and then to tell relevant stories that help them see how they could change their worlds i love that and i i'm now using that going on forward so we're not just the storytellers but we're the sense makers first and then we're the storytellers that help people to take action. So big thanks to Graham for the for yes, that one, then, thank you, Graham. then Richard. <laughs> and, and fit and value as well. You know, kind of mantra number one: business fit and value. That that as well. I think linking into the sense making and storytelling. I think was was another standout one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think mantra one for me is it's not. It's not number one because of this, but for me, it is the most important. It's If you're going into any prospecting conversation, having worked out that you believe there could be a fit and believing that you've est- estimated you can add value, if someone doesn't want to speak to you, it's sort of not your problem, right? You know, it's sort of, it's a total mindset change. And, and that for me, early days in my sales career was an absolute light bulb moment. And we've, you know, we train all of our team and, and all of our customers in, in that way of thinking. It changed your mindset to proactive proactive outreach. Yeah, and I think the the other one that really stands out, and obviously Graham's a real expert in this and, and a real, you know, very passionate is is about the use of social selling. The two things was content's not just king, it's now the whole royal family was his phrase, which I thought was I thought was absolutely wonderful. But also, you know, that comment that the hard work is in engaging and nurturing the relationship. So there is sometimes this idea that social selling is easier than perhaps the classic way of you know hitting the phones or something but but in actually it takes consistent focus and discipline and effort in order to make it actually come alive and be a useful part of your approach with customers absolutely we were we were really lucky because graham ran a session for all of our all of our sales execs when he was with us and he's really nailed how to nurture and and, and uncover and peak interest through LinkedIn with its sort of 8 million plus users. It's, it is the, I guess it's the B2B database that, that is continually updated by the users and by its data. And he, he came up with, uh, I know we talk about this in the podcast, but he talked about lighting up the dark funnel, um, which I, th- I think could be the name of a song. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, I also referred back to a friend of mine, Craig Elias in, in Canada, who talks about the window of dissatisfaction. And, and really that comes back down to sleuthing for people with challenges that you could solve through social is not really any different from what else we do. It's just another channel, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's a very powerful one. I mean, I'm a big fan of Sales Navigator. You know, I mean, it's such a such a powerful resource for salespeople to be, you know, making, you know, full use of and and social selling. It was the reference I think um, that Graham made to, to Professor John Cole on the memory. You know, when we got a problem, we interrogate our memory first. So who do I know who might be able to help me? Because it's about timing. Sometimes the customer may not have a need now. But when they do, you want to, I mean, a good friend of mine, Anthony Steers, talks about it like a pizza menu. I know you might not want a pizza now, but if you do at any stage in the future, here's the menu. So you know how to get hold of me. And I think that, and also keeping in touch, keeping, you know, raising the customer's awareness through social, et cetera, that you're there. Just so when the, when the stars align, your first point of contact for them. I think that was a really great commentary. Yeah, absolutely. We, we always talk about, you need to be found for when that right moment comes. So make sure you're at the top of the inbox or make sure you're in the inbox for when someone searches and now that's not enough anymore it's be found anywhere and everywhere and particularly in the places where people spend their time and i think the the final one as well was you know i'm a big fan of sales playbooks we work with clients on producing sales playbooks for them and that what there was a very powerful comment from graham about 
changing it to match the buyer's journey. So lots of organizations have a sales process, but we've got to remember the sales process doesn't float in midair on its own. It's integrated and it should be aligned to the buying journey or the buying process the customer goes through. So I think that that really is very important thing that should be at the core of an effective sales block is how do your customers buy? Yeah, 100%. And it's all part for me, really, of that professionalism of our industry. You know, how can you be professional without the manual or the guide that helps people to learn their craft and to be successful? Yeah, it's wonderful. That was a great, absolutely fantastic interview. Thank you for, 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 on behalf of the Insiders listeners, thank you very much for getting Graham in the studio, Richard, and recording that. It was great to hear an in-person episode. Hopefully we'll get the chance to do some more in the future. Yeah, thank you. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was it was an impromptu chat. Big thanks to Graham for being part of it. And uh, we'll, we'll do more, no doubt, fairly soon. Fantastic. Well, that brings us to a close of this special episode of the Insiders uh, podcast. So thank you very much for joining me, Richard. And of course, thank you to Graham as well for taking the time to share his wisdom. The Insiders by Durham Lane. Subscribe today to never miss an episode.